Okay, this is the first in the series of how to set up an Atari ST, but we're not going to be using an actual ST, we're going to be using an emulator called Steam. So this first video is about how to download the right version, how to install it, configure it, so it runs just like a real ST. And I'm going to cover all of its menus, all of its configurations, everything you need to do to get it looking and feeling and smelling like an ST. All right, this is the main window and a couple of dialog boxes for the emulator. Now, there have been other emulators as well. There has been the Saint emulator, uh, which hasn't seen a release since 2015. Uh, there's also uh, the Atari emulator. And this one hasn't had a release since uh, February 2019, although I've seen some activity on it recently. So I'll be using this emulator, but no matter which emulator you use, the techniques I talk about or to demonstrate are those going to be used on a regular Atari ST or one of the emulators? So today I'm going to talk about how to download this and install it. So first we need to go to the website where it's at. And you'll see here it's on SourceForge. Now don't click on the download link when you go there. By the way, the link's in the description of my video. But don't click on that because it'll automatically do download the 32-bit version. And we'll talk about the different versions here. Instead, we're going to uh, cancel this download if you've already done it. We're going to go over to its menu on uh, SourceForge, and we're going to click on the uh, Files link. So we're going to go back here, find the Files link, make sure you're there. Click on that. You see the latest release uh, has a history of them, but uh, there's a beta. But here's the latest release, 4.0. So when you click on this, you'll see, again, 4.02 version, and you'll see here a list of all the files and the current releases. This may be different. This is release 5. I think he's already put out a release 6, uh, but they're the same version. The first thing you need to notice is there's 32-bit and 64-bit of each type. Now, this one here, if you notice, 32-bit has DD and Direct3D. Uh, don't, by the way, don't do the debug unless you're a programmer or you want to test some things. So anyways, the uh, different uh, types are down here. You notice that DirectDraw for older systems, such as Windows 7, and Direct3D uh, is for the newer Windows 10 systems. So you find one of 32-bit or 64-bit, whichever is appropriate for your system, and probably the, the D3D. Uh, don't click on the debug like I did here. OK, let's first talk directory structure. Now, this is your PC here. Now, I created an Atari ST directory because I have more than one type of emulator. But underneath that, I have separate emulators. Like I said, they have the Atari, the Saint, and the one I currently use, which is Steam. I also created a directory separately for the Atari operating system files. Now, underneath the Atari ST directory, I created two other files, the C drive directory and the D drive directory. These are not your C and D drive on your PC. Rather, they're directories, which are named for your Atari ST, is going to use that as a C drive and a D drive. And they're going to be accessed from both operating systems, both for the PC and the Atari. The Atari is going to use TOS, which is a graphical environmental manager. That's what GEM's for. And DOS through the, for your PC. And the Atari is going to be accessing the C drive with directory structure, as you see here, that I've created for mine. And just to be clear, you can see we can open up a file explorer through your PC and access the same directory structure uh, through file explorer. Now, if we go back to the directory structure, you'll see that I've created several directories. The one marked in red are the ones for the operating system for the uh, Atari. The other two directories are types of programs I'm going to install. The other drive is going to store downloaded files, disk install routines, everything I'm going to need to install stuff to these other directories. Now, the red directories here are sort of mandated by the Atari operating system. But the other directories, you can set up however you want. For example, in my apps directory, I have categories for different types of programs, database, desktop publishing, etc. But if you're just going to investigate a few or have a couple of your favorite programs running, you could just install the program underneath your apps directory. And of course, the same thing goes with any other software that you might install. For example, under games, uh, you may want to install them by type, like action, board games, driving, whatever. Or if you're not going to have that many of those again, you can just put in the name of the game, install it there. Now, what's extremely helpful is to remember that any of these directories can be accessed by the regular computer directory. You can't run programs from it, but you can move things around by accessing them through File Manager. 
you can run into problems doing that, but it's much easier than working through the Atari's gem operating system to move stuff around. Now, depending upon where you saved your file and extracted it to, you're going to end up with a directory uh, with your installation. Now, I put mine here. It's the Steam SSE 402 64-bit uh, version in Direct3D. So I know which one it is. You just can save it anywhere you want. But you'll end up with all these files here, or most of these files, in that directory. So let's take a closer look. Again, I'm in my directory, wherever it extracted to, it'll be yours. The first uh, directory structure is the ASCII file. And these are those two disk image files I talked about. They have other programs inside of them or where you can store them. They're not the GEMDOS drives, they're the other type of drives, which we'll cover here. So the next directory we want to talk about is we go back up one level, and we go to the cartridge directory, which we're basically sort of going to uh, ignore. There's a cartridge image program here that'll run from your Atari, uh, but we're very rarely going to use those. The config, you notice it was written out on a few days later. It's because I saved some configurations during testing, uh, two different kinds of configurations, which you can recall. Uh, docs, exactly what it says. Here's the manual and some other information about how to make cards, how to make disk, disk images, and the like. Now going back up again, we end up with the drive sound. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, sounds that you know, a drive would have made uh, from the real uh, days of physical hardware. I'm going to ignore that because I usually leave it off. Here's a couple of language files uh, that you can use if you want to operate with your native language instead of English. Uh, the next one is macros, and we can record different macros to happen and steps to happen, but it won't be till later videos that I cover that. Memory snapshots, you see it has a later date. That's because I was playing some Monopoly to test it out and everything. And you can actually go in there and resume that game or whatever uh, at that particular time when you took a snapshot of the system. Patches. Patches are patches for certain games to allow them to run on different versions of an ST or even this emulator. Think of it as uh, updates for uh, programs for Windows. Plugins. Not sure what some of these are, uh, archive access and all that. Uh, but the disk image list is what we want to take a look at here. There are thousands or hundreds at least of disks that were released uh, illegally or illegally for an ST. And this database here will explain to you what's on which one. Uh, you can access this through the program, so we'll be looking at it then. Okay, let's go back. Let's close that down. And we'll head back over here to the root directory. And program, PRG, well, these are the programs. This is the initial setup for your ST. What does it look like uh, when you start up uh, the ST? It's going to use these files to uh, create that. Uh, screenshots, I've already done some screenshots here. And we'll learn how to configure which type of a JPEG or whatever and how to do a screenshot later. Similarly, the next one, uh, if we've gotten the shortcuts, there's a default one. Uh, we'll talk about how to set that up in a later video. Now, the rest of the files in your root directory are a output printer file, uh, RTF a little, uh, version of a file. But there's your exe you're going to run each and every time you run the emulator. This file here is a, a floppy disk image with files inside of it, just to give you one to start with. Now, the first time you run this and you're one in Windows Defender, Defender will pop up and protect your PC, and you'll get this. And it says exactly that. Smart screen is stopping it from running, trying to protect you. It's perfectly fine. You just click on more info and go down to the bottom and say run anyway. So I'm going to zoom in here so you can read the next screens. It steps you through uh, different things. First of all, uh, shortcut. Well, I already have one, so I'm not going to do that. But you probably want to say OK. And then it's going to prompt you to find the, those toss files, that operating system file uh, that uh, we talked about earlier, storing it. So as soon as you click on OK, you get a dialog box, and you have to go find it in your browser or your file explorer. And there it is. I'm going to use the 206 version, and it goes on to the next one. Now here it's asking where those uh, disk image files, those floppy disk images, that ST image, are going to be stored. You're going to put them all in one spot. You know, like I showed you earlier, we have a place for that. I put them on my uh, D drive. Use this little dia dialog box, click there. 
Uh, or you can have them in a separate drive, but right now for there. And now I want to talk about your hard drives. And it's going to talk about those GemDOS ones. So we're going to say yes. And I'm going to go find that C drive that I created. Go up here to the C drive. And that's going to be the boot drive for the hard drive. And there we are. We're ready to go. And it says all you got to do is uh, press F12 to get in and out of it. But let's, uh, let's take a look now at the interface. So now we're going to talk about the menu system. And it's quite extensive. So we're going to go up to the top here and start on the left. And the first button is a reboot button. Left is a warm reboot. Right is a cold reboot. Uh, that's the off on. Uh, left click runs or stops depending upon its current state. You can have a fast forward here uh, to make it run faster uh, temporarily, maybe during intensive disk operations. Uh, the next is a memory snapshot. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I talked about Monopoly. I could take a copy of the computer as it's playing, keep it, and recall it later on. Because a lot of games didn't have uh, the ability to recall or save and recall games. Screenshot, simply that. We'll show you how to configure that later. Uh, this is to paste text into the ST, and you can put a delay so you can have time to open up a dialog box or something like that. It allows you to paste ASCII text into a dialog box or an application. Uh, the next one is a load save configuration file. Again, those are the ones I did earlier, and you can set up your configurations. The next section is basically a status section. It tells me I'm running an STE model. I'm on TOS 2.06, the US version. Um, and I have uh, one megabyte of memory, 60 hertz, A's and B drive, and basically some chipsets. Some indicate uh, like your blitter, which I will talk about later, uh, is running. Now I'm going to go over these lightly on the right hand side. This is your disk manager. There's a lot of options for that. Uh, again, we'll get into it later. The joystick configuration, patches that we talked about earlier, uh, some shortcuts we can save. Uh, whole lot of options that we have to go through, just some information. Now, I don't know why they call this menu options simplified. There's nothing simple about them. The first item is the machine configuration. And what that does is that you can choose which model of ST you want to uh, run. Uh, the older ones, which is the STF, STFFM, Mega ST. But we're going to use the STE for most of what we're doing, especially with the TOS version we're going to choose. Next, we're going to choose the memory size. The ST came with uh, the original one with 512. Uh, we're going to go to a 4 megabyte model and uh, do that. And you'll see a message here that you'll see later on in the other parts of this dialog box that some changes won't take effect until you do a code reset. So now we drop down to the video setting, the second one on the list. You'll see here that the Atari came with two different physical monitors, one color with two different resolutions and one monochrome. Uh, the next part of it is the borders are going to be off or normal, whatever. Uh, the Atari came with large white borders around the screen. Uh, we're going to turn those off so you get a nice clean look here. So after you've decided whether or not you want borders on, we're going to drop down here to the SD aspect ratio. You get one that looks like 16 by 9. There's the Atari one. I usually leave it like this. So if you're a real retro gamer, you may want to turn on the scan lines for an authentic look. I don't bother with V-Sync. And the frequency really depends as well. It shouldn't really affect you that you're in an emulator. Uh, it's up to you. And we'll talk about uh, Blitter after we get into the system. Now the next section is TOS. And that's the operating system. And during the install, we loaded up the latest release of the operating system, but you should go back and already have downloaded uh, several different versions. And you go into here and find wherever you did that. In the early 102 version, for example, you can download a couple of different types so that the older games will run with the older version of TOS, the newer games will run with the newer version. And note that when you load it up, it becomes the selected one, so I'm going to select the other one and save it. The next section is your keyboard and mouse. And the first drop down is whatever language you're using on your PC. If you're wherever, select the one that you like and use that. And then uh, once you have selected that, uh, you come over here and you can have your keyboard clicks on or off. It's That's really up to you. What's really neat though is this next section, battery no. That means it's just like a real ST, there's no battery. Uh, yes, it 
it has a battery, but what's really important, it has a Y2K fix. Yes, remember Y2K? You just click on this, and it'll do its best as converting all the writes and all that uh, to a Y2K. Okay, mice. Basically, once you are running your emulator and you click inside the area, uh, it captures your mouse. It becomes the ST mouse. Now, I use the Alt-Tab key to get out of it and get back to dialog boxes, but you can play with these settings here to have it capture your mouse when you move over it automatically. There are different problems with each mode. Uh, and there's also a third or another method uh, besides uh, that. It's the VM friendly mouse. And when you, you do that, it's used for people using virtual machines. Again, play with those settings and your mouse speed. Uh, you don't have to worry about the other settings there. Uh, but do whatever you need to do until you get a good feel of how you like your mouse. Okay, next up is I.O. ports. Now, basically, no PC anymore has the ports that were on the Atari, especially MIDI ports. Uh, you can remap this, but unless you have a MIDI-compatible program that can redirect, uh, it doesn't really help. Parallel port, everybody's got them disabled. Nobody uses parallel port for printing anymore. Change this to file, and then you can sit there and point to an actual file, so it'll write the printer output to a file. And in later programs, I'll show you how to convert a PCL uh, output and send it to your printer. So put it wherever you want that print output to go, uh, depending upon the program. But if you do a PCL output, I'll show you a little bit later the program that converts all PCL files, compatible ones, uh, to PDFs. And lastly, uh, once we get done with this, uh, let me choose a place here. Uh, we're going to go down to the serial, good old serial ports, yes, where we used to connect our modems to. So just set that to none. Okay, the next one is MIDI. Now MIDI is Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It was a big thing on Atari. Uh, you can sort of just ignore all this for the general use. It uh, was used to connect the musical instruments with a MIDI interface so you could record or play back uh, music uh, using that interface. I actually had a MIDI keyboard and I did uh, some consulting for some artists uh, to make sure that they hooked up their studios to their Atari so they could create their music. But again, for our purposes, don't worry about it. Okay, the next setting is a general setting. And you want to leave your run speed at 100% for right now, but you can play with it later. Uh, same with your slow motion, leave that. Now, right now, it's set up for fast forward unlimited. I would limit it to 200, the lowest setting, just to, to get started. The rest of these settings are pretty self-explanatory. You can play with them later on when you're using the emulator. Depending upon the software you're running at the time, you may want to change these, but I've never really had much of a problem with the keys interfering or pausing the emulation. So you can just basically leave them as standard settings. Okay, sound settings is next. Now, I don't want to bother with muting any sounds or anything like that. As far as the sound driver, the default should be good. You can select all your existing uh, drivers that you have on your system uh, as your default sound driver. But I would just leave it as is. The only thing I would do on this page is maybe uh, come down, leave all these alone, but the drive sound, turn that thing off. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, unclick that uh, to keep the drive sound off. Now there's also a setting down here to how to record or where to record sounds uh, from the emulator, but I've never used the emulator to record sounds. I've always used an external program. Now with display, we're going to get into some really important things about how you're going to run your system. Uh, all the settings are fine up here as far as frame skip and things like that. Same with these other ones as well. Uh, you don't have to worry about the automatic resizing. But when he comes here, watch what happens when I change the sizes. The size of your emulator display changes accordingly. And you can change it to a smaller or larger. Uh, you can set it at quadruple. You get a nice, clear, crisp uh, display. And while you're at low resolution, you might as well go ahead and do it for the uh, medium as well. And the high resolution has a double size, so you would do that. And lastly, on display, page. If you have some place you want to save your screenshots, just go ahead and choose that. And you can also change that from BMP to JPEG. And the quality, just leave it on high. And you get some really nice screenshots. Now moving to on your on-screen display, what's being shown, okay, turn these off. I mean, I'm going to leave them on now so you can see them later, but turn those off. They're nothing more than just irritating. The rest of the settings you can play with later on, but I'll leave them default to being off. The next setting will allow you to go to a full screen mode if you click on your little square at the top right of your uh, window. Instead of going to window, a full window size, it switches over to uh, full screen mode. 
the next setting is color and you only need to use this if you're having problems seeing some things on your monitor I'm finding it to be pretty bulletproof just out of the box but again if you're having some certain problems then try playing with these settings now the next setting is configuration. I think it can be pretty handy. It depends upon how complex you want. But you notice it has I have set up here for monochrome or standard, which will automatically set up my uh, emulator for those. I can just quick click on that and move to another one. And you notice down here you can tell which parts of the setup it will save in that configuration file. I, again, haven't used it that much. Okay, in order to demonstrate macros, I went to a full screen implementation. And I'm going to create a new macro here or call it test. Now that we titled it, we're going to go down to the playback and record controls, and there they are down there. Now these are playback settings here off to the right, and uh, we don't really have to mess with them right now, uh, but they're available to use, make changes with when you play it back. So you notice I have the mouse in the middle of the screen, so that when I do this, I'm going to go ahead and change the color. That's what it will do here, and say red, and then say OK. Now that we have that recorded, I'm going to go uh, and change it back to a different color, but different than the original one and different than the one we have now. I'm going to go ahead and click a color here, uh, do blue, and say OK. So now I got a, a blue screen. So I'm going to put the mouse back in the center. And that's important. You have to start your macro running from the mouse being in the same exact position. So you'll see here as I ran the macro, it went and found that found that and say OK and it ran the macro successfully. Now I'm not so sure how beneficial this would be in your day-to-day -day use of the uh, emulator but the capability exists. Now as far as the next item, the startup tab, the most important thing here is probably uh, restore previous state. When you shut it down it will come back up exactly the way it was. The next section is the icon functionality where you can change out icons for specialized icons of your own design. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many people would use this if you're an icon person and you really want to style your SD, uh, you can change these out. The next section is file associations, and that's just like Windows associating like a JPEG with a certain program. If you notice that there are certain things already associated and some aren't, I wouldn't change anything here. The standard file associations uh, work just fine. The last item I want to talk about is the miscellaneous ones, which there's not much here. I would don't touch anything except maybe on the advanced settings enable that. Certain programs uh, will work better with that enabled. Now that we have all the menus talked about, let's talk about layout. I would, I would recommend you have your system set up here and you can put two of the modules off to the right hand side. Uh, basically your settings and your disk. These are the two modules you're going to be using about 90 percent of the time. Uh, the joystick you can bring up at any time, uh, no problem. Same with the other ones, but these are the two you're going to be using. And once you place them there, if you leave it there, when you close down your emulator, they'll appear in the exact same place. Okay, there you have it, a detailed but hopefully helpful guide in installing and configuring the Atari Steam SSE emulator. The next video will cover the disk menu in more detail. We'll talk about enabling disk drives and loading floppy images to the A and B drive slots. After that, we'll get into configuring and saving your SD's desktop. Hope you enjoyed this, and then feel free to ask questions or make a request for a deeper dive into one of the functions and of course we'll get into demoing Atari software and games. Hey if you found this video helpful don't forget to like this video and if you want more of the same subscribe to the Atari Geek. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter. The links to those are in the description of this video.